Good morning, nine o'clock, time to begin our class on Revelation. We're in lesson number 20. We're in chapter eight and we're right at the end of chapter eight. We'll start today in verse 13 and then move on into chapter nine. Let me remind everyone that the audio copies of these lessons, any handouts we have, and eventually all the class notes will be available on the internet at www.revelation.study. Revelation.study. You can also get there by clicking through uh, from the church's uh, web page on the Bible class page. Also on that page, you can find all the notes from our class of Zechariah, which we had uh, just before we started the class on Revelation. Let's begin our class with a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, Father. We're thankful for this opportunity we have to gather and study your word and to worship you. Father, we're thankful for this wonderful book of Revelation, all that it has in there for us, Father. Such encouragement and hope, Father. So many promises, and and we're, we're so glad that we can see in there your love for the church, Father, and your care for the church. Father, we also see in that book, Father, that Satan is prowling around actively engaged in this world in our prayers that we will not be ignorant of his devices, Father, but we will see them for what they are. And Father, most of all, we're thankful for all that this book tells us about your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and we look forward to his return. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Last week we looked at the opening of the seventh seal in chapter 8, and we saw that inside the seventh seal were seven trumpets which began to be blown after a half hour of silence in heaven and after an angel scattered fire from the altar onto the earth. We talked about what that meant last week. We also saw again that these judgments against Rome so far are partial judgments and we also saw that they are coming in response to the prayers of the saints. If we're ever tempted to doubt the tremendous power of a praying church, then we need to study the book of Revelation. The early church had faith to move mountains. And in fact, verse 8 shows us their prayers moved the mountain of Rome right into the sea. In verses 7 through 12 of chapter 8, the first four trumpets were blown. The fifth trumpet will sound at the beginning of chapter 9. The sixth trumpet will sound in chapter 9, verse 13. The seventh trumpet won't sound until chapter 11, verse 15. Verse 13 of chapter 8, which we're about to start here, uh, gives us a preview of those final three trumpets. Verse 13 of chapter 8. And And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Where the King James Version has angel there in verse 13, an angel flying through the midst of heaven, most translations have eagle, an eagle flying through the midst of heaven. An eagle does seem to have better textual support than angel. Uh, Here's what Barclay says. Here we have a dramatic and eerie picture of an empty sky and a solitary eagle winging its way across its zenith, forewarning of the doom to come. And I like what Phillips says. He says, a solitary eagle flying in mid-heaven, crying out in pity for the inhabitants of the earth, is out of its context bizarre, but set as it is, it is almost unbearably poignant. But the Greek word translated eagle here could also mean vulture, could mean vulture. For example, the same Greek word is found in Matthew 24, verse 28, where in the King James Version we read, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. But in the English Standard Version, which I think is better in that, for that verse, we read, Whereas the corpse is, there the vultures shall be gathered. Well, why do many translations use eagle here in verse 13 of chapter 8 when those same translations use vultures for the same word in Matthew 24? The answer is because it's not exactly the same Greek word. One is singular and the other is plural. Eagles typically fly alone, but vultures typically don't. Vultures usually fly in groups. 
And yes, I did look up what you call a group of vultures, and it's either a kettle of vultures, a committee of vultures, or a wake of vultures. Anyone who spent as much time in meetings as I have likes committee. Committee of vultures. One rarely hears about a lone vulture. But if a lone vulture is what was intended here, then verse 13 moves from being eerie to incredibly eerie. Uh, as we have perhaps a lone flying vulture in the sky shouting, woe, 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 in anticipation of these final three trumpets. This imagery may be pointing us back to a prophecy in Hosea. Hosea 8, verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth, he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed my law. There the target was Israel, here the target is Rome, but I think similar imagery is being used here with regard to Rome, and a, a, that, that's used in Hosea also against then an enemy of God, which it turned out to be his own people there in Hosea. Well, what is the purpose of this lone eagle or this lone vulture? Well, it's the same purpose as the trumpets. It is providing a warning of something yet to come. Specifically, this flying bird is warning of the final three trumpets that are about to sound. And those trumpets are themselves warnings, aren't they? When you're getting a warning of the warnings, <laughs> that should tell you something bad is coming. I mean, right now we're getting warnings about the warnings, and the warnings are telling us about something else. So these warnings are layered on top of each other. Well, why all of these warnings? We've already talked about one reason. They provide Rome a final opportunity to repent. That door will close eventually. Hadn't closed yet. They still have an opportunity to repent. Another reason we see all these warnings, though, is so that no one can ever say to God, I did not know. I did not know. No one can ever say that to God. And I think that's a message for us today as well. We also have been given many warnings, many warnings about the judgment that's yet to come. With so many people in this world starving for the truth, I shudder to think about those who sit in worship assemblies of the Lord's people week after week after week and yet stubbornly refuse to obey the gospel. How many trumpets have they heard? How many warnings have they failed to heed? And what will they say to Jesus? They won't say, I didn't know. They can't say that. Notice that phrase in verse 13, the inhabitants of the earth. That's the group to whom these warnings are directed. We've already discussed how the ungodly Romans are pictured in this book. They're pictured as those that dwell upon the earth. That's how they're described in this book, those that dwell upon the earth, while the faithful Christians are pictured already as dwelling safely in heaven, even while they were still living on the earth and suffering persecution. But God pictures them safe in heaven in this book, and His wrath is directed against what He calls those that dwell upon the earth. When used in that way, heaven and earth don't as much depict locations as they depict states, a state of a person. And isn't that exactly what Paul described? Colossians 3, 1 through 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. In that sense, God's people dwell in heaven even while they're still on this earth. Our minds, our hearts are set on things above. Yes, someday we will dwell in heaven literally. But for now, we can dwell in heaven spiritually. And that's how Revelation depicts the early church. And that's something the Bible tells us is true of all Christians. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Questions about chapter 8. Chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. 
Well, with the fifth trumpet, we see the first of the three woes that were proclaimed by the eagle or the vulture in verse 13 that we just studied. The previous terrors included, these trumpets included terrors from nature. But now we begin to see in these trumpets terrors beyond nature. This trumpet is also the first trumpet that directly affects man. The previous trumpets were affecting man indirectly through his environment. So these trumpets are getting ever more serious. The star fallen from heaven in verse 1 is described as someone who has been given the key of the bottomless pit. But we've already discussed what it means to be given the key to something. Uh, It means that this fallen star has been given authority over this bottomless pit. If I have the key to my house or the key to my car, that means I can open it, I can use it, I can drive it or live in it. I have authority over that thing. So this, 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 this star that's fallen from heaven has been given, given the key to this bottomless pit. Uh, clearly, that authority is a delegated authority. We can tell because he's been given the key. So it's, it's authority that's been given to him for a purpose. Well, what does he do with this authority? He opens the bottomless pit, releasing smoke that causes darkness to cover the the sky and the sun. Well, first question, who is this fallen star? Sometimes, perhaps rarely, but sometimes in this book, the obvious answer turns out to be the correct answer. And I think that's the case here. I think this fallen star is Satan. In Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Linsky disagrees. He says, no, this this fallen star is a personification of the judgment that's coming. Um, But in my opinion, the fallen star is Satan, the power behind uh, behind Rome. Um, We see something similar in Isaiah 14. Uh, Verse 14, verse 4 rather, of Isaiah 14 tells us that that chapter is a proverb against the king of Babylon, king of Babylon. But then when you read Isaiah 14, you start thinking, that doesn't really sound much like the king of Babylon. Picking up in verse 12 of Isaiah 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So you read that in Isaiah 14 and you're asking yourself, well, who is being described? Is that the king of Babylon or is that Satan? I think the answer is both. Both. Because... Satan was the power behind the king of Babylon. I think God is addressing the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 by looking past the king of Babylon to the power behind the throne, which was Satan. So I think we see descriptions of both in Isaiah 14. I think we see the same same thing in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Verse 12 of Ezekiel 28 tells us that's directed toward the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre. But then you read Isaiah, Ezekiel 28, and you start thinking, hmm, is that really the king of Tyre? Verse 14 of Ezekiel 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. I think Ezekiel 28 is also directed really to two both to the king of Tyre and to the power behind the king of Tyre, which was Satan. I think God is looking at the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 and looking at the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28 and addressing both them and the power behind them, which was Satan. I think we're going to see something very similar here in the book of Revelation as God addresses Rome, but also looks beyond Rome to the power behind Rome, which was Satan. But, of course, this book is also going to show Satan for what he is, and that is a defeated enemy. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The bottomless pit, or the abyss, that's where the demons and the ungodly are consigned. That's a familiar image. Isaiah 24, 21 through 22, shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. 
at Luke 8, 30 through 31, and Jesus said, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him, and they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. That's the pit. Well, what do we know about Satan? <clears throat> well, first we know that Satan has been judged and cast out. Luke 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John 16, 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So that's happened. Second, we know that Satan is called the ruler of this world or the power, prince of the power of the air. John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. John 14, verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. John 16, 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Third, we're told that Satan has, or at least had, uh, the power of death. Hebrews 2, 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And fourth, we're told that Satan is actively, actively at work in this world. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So what can we conclude from those scriptures? Well, we conclude, conclude that although Satan has, past tense, been defeated, Satan still retains some power. And Satan is still active in pursuing objectives that are opposed to God's will. Such as, for example, trying to use the Roman Empire to destroy the church in the first century while the church was still in its infancy. As we study through the remainder of this book, we're going to see Satan's hand in that. Some people leave the book of Revelation with a very misguided view about Satan. So let's be very clear about something right now. Nothing we read about Satan in the book of Revelation is going to contradict anything we know about Satan from the rest of the Bible. If the Bible tells us that Satan is active, and it does, then this book will not tell us that Satan is inactive as some have concluded. If, we're, if we concluded that, that means we've made a wrong turn somewhere. Yes, Satan has some power, but Satan has that power only because God allows it. But why? Why does God allow Satan to operate in this world? Well, because Satan has a role to play. Satan has a role to play in undoing the damage that Satan did in the garden. I think another reason Satan's allowed to operate is because through his operation, men can more clearly see who's on God's side and who's not on God's side. 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. 19, For there must also be heresies among you. Why? That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And perhaps Satan is allowed to operate in this world today so that God's people can be strengthened as they overcome those temptations. James 1 verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. But you mean God has power over Satan? Absolutely, absolutely he does. In fact, look at what we see right here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. Satan is given a key and Satan uses that key to carry out God's instructions for the fifth trumpet. God is using Satan to carry out his, God's plans here. Just as God used Babylon in his judgment of Judah, just as God used Assyria in his judgment of Israel, just as God used Babylon again in his judgment of Assyria, just as God used Persia in his judgment of Babylon, just as God used Greece in his judgment of Persia, just as God used Rome in his judgment of Greece, just as God used Rome in his judgment of Jerusalem, God is using Satan in his judgment of Rome. 
Satan is a defeated enemy. Satan is doing what God's commanding him to do here. If Satan has any power, it's power granted him by God. Yes, Satan is active today. Absolutely he is. Yes, Satan is a roaring lion. But Satan is a roaring lion on a leash. Satan is not omnipotent. He's never had that power. He certainly does not have that power today after the cross. In fact, we saw in our study of Zechariah that one of, the, one of the things that occurred in the first century as a result of prophecy in, in, in Zechariah was the diminishment of Satan's powers. Zechariah 13, verse 2, I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. That happened in the first century. Isn't that the diminishment we're looking at here as well, something like that? Look at verse 1 here in chapter 9. It says, Satan was given the key to the bottomless pit. Satan was permitted to open that pit. He would not have been allowed to open that pit if he had not been given the key. Satan doesn't even have the key to his own house unless God gives it to him. Satan can't unleash unclean spirits on this world. He can open that door only with permission. Yes, these images are figurative. Let's not lose track of that. But I think these figures are teaching us some important lessons about Satan and about his forces of darkness that are arrayed against the church. You know, the world often views Satan and, and God as, as equals that are locked in some sort of cosmic battle between good and evil. That view is completely false, totally false. Satan, in his pride, may have aspired equality with God, but Satan is a creature. Satan is not the creator. God is as far above Satan as God is as far above the rest of his creation. This book of Revelation is not describing a battle between God and Satan in which the outcome somehow remains uncertain. There are no cliffhangers in the book of Revelation. Satan has already been defeated when the book of Revelation opens. Satan and his evil minions were defeated at the cross. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, it being the cross. Jesus' death judged the world. It didn't judge Jesus. Jesus' death defeated Satan. It didn't defeat Jesus. Satan was defeated by an event that at least for a moment, Satan probably thought was going to be his greatest victory ever. And yet it was his greatest defeat ever. Things are not always what they seem, are they? We know that Jesus was not what the Jews expected. Do you know what? I don't think Jesus was what Satan expected either. One of the biggest misconceptions about Satan involves how Satan works in this world today. For example, does Satan supernaturally cause people to act one way or another? As the old saying goes, the devil made me do it. No, he does not. Satan does not supernaturally override the free will of the ungodly any more than the Holy Spirit supernaturally overrides the free will of the godly. Man has free will, and that goes for both the righteous and the unrighteous. Isn't that what James told us? James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away, how? Of his own lust and enticed. The fish retains free will. Bite the worm or don't bite the worm. Take the hook or don't take the hook. But once that fish clamps down on that hook, while the free will remains, the choices no longer remain, do they? And that's how it is with all sin. And that's why sin is so dangerous. Sin takes away our choices. 
So how does Satan operate in the world? If it's not supernaturally, how does he do it? Well, one way that Satan operates in the world today is through his children. Just as one way God operates in this world today is through his children. You mean Satan has children? Yes, he does. Ephesians 2 verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, where? In the children of disobedience. John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Yes, Satan has children, and he works through his children. And I think from that verse in John 8, we see another way that Satan works today. He keeps people from hearing the truth. He keeps people from hearing the truth. Mark 4, 15, And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, and when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Well, how does Satan do that? How does Satan take away the word that was sown in someone's heart? Well, we know how that happens. We know how that happens. That happens when Satan creates confusion and, and presents temptations and presents distractions to that person that replaces the word that was sown in that person's heart. And that process is not a supernatural operation. That's something we see all around us every day. That's something we struggle against. Oh, but I think Satan must have supernatural powers, someone might say. Why does Satan need supernatural powers when he has a television set? Why does Satan need supernatural powers when he has an internet connection? Why does Satan need supernatural powers when people's Bibles are covered with dust? Why does Satan need supernatural powers when he has a legion of false teachers who are handling the Word of God deceitfully and who are twisting the Scriptures into their own destruction? 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, 2 Peter 3, verse 16. Why does Satan need supernatural powers when he has tin pot dictators in Asia and the Middle East who ban Bibles and evangelism on penalty of death? Why does Satan need supernatural powers when Planned Parenthood performs over 300,000 abortions every year in this country? You know, some people read the book of Revelation and conclude that Satan's all bound up and no longer active in the world today. And they base that false view on a misinterpretation of Revelation 20, verse 2, which we'll get to eventually. But do we really need to wait until we get to Revelation 20 to know that Satan is active in this world today? How can anyone look around today and conclude that Satan is not active? You know, there aren't too many false doctrines that can be disproved just by watching the evening news, but surely this is one of them. The spirit that was now working in the children of disobedience in Ephesians 2 verse 2 is still working in the children of disobedience. And we see that evidence all around us today. It's true that Satan is not operating today as he did in times past through demon possession, for example. But it's false to say that Satan's not operating at all today. We see its evidence all around us. And more importantly, the scriptures confirm it and tell us that he is. One way in which Satan operates today, we see right here in verse 2 of chapter 9. There we see Satan releasing smoke that darkens the sun and the sky. Reminds us of 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And Ephesians 4, verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Satan blinds people's minds to keep them from seeing the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. How does he do that? By operating directly on that person? No. By operating on the gospel? No. Satan blinds that person's mind 
by placing a blinding smoke between that person and the gospel. Of course, our mission is to cut through that smoke, but that smoke is there. We know where it came from. I think the smoke in verse 2 represents the spiritual and moral blindness that Satan creates in this world. But notice something very important about this blinding smoke in verse 2. This blinding smoke in verse 2 is a punishment from God. When we studied Zechariah 12 verse 4, we saw that God sometimes uses blindness and confusion to punish the enemies of his people. I think we're seeing something similar here against Rome. And doesn't the darkness in our own society show us the terrible effect of such a, a punishment? Moral and spiritual blindness, it's a disease that destroys the heart of a person, it destroys the heart of a nation. But just as the prodigal son was allowed to sink into the mud of that pig pen, I think God sometimes allows a nation to sink into a pig pen with the hope that perhaps, having struck bottom, they will wake up and come to themselves and repent. Perhaps like Nineveh, the preaching of Jonah. You mean God uses something like this as a punishment? Romans 1 starting in verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's a perfect description of Rome. They were serving and worshiping the Roman Caesar rather than God. Continuing on, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Does God use this as a punishment? Absolutely he does. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What we see in verses 1 and 2 of Revelation 9 is a vivid picture of moral and spiritual decay. Well, does that picture fit what happened with Rome? According to Gibbon, one of the four primary reasons behind the eventual collapse of the Roman Empire was inner decadence. Here's how Francis Schaeffer described it. As the empire ground down, the decadent Romans were given to a thirst for violence and a gratification of the senses. Apathy was the chief mark of the late empire, and the Roman economy slumped lower and lower, burdened with an aggravated inflation and a costly government. Authoritarianism increased to counter the apathy. Since work was no longer done voluntarily, it was brought increasingly under the authority of the state, and freedoms were lost. For example, laws were passed binding small farmers to their land. So because of the general apathy and its results and because of oppressive controls, few thought the old civilization worth saving. Rome did not fall because of external forces such as the invasion by the barbarians. Rome had no sufficient inward base. The barbarians only completed the breakdown and Rome eventually became a ruin. The lowering of moral standards contributed directly to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Schaefer says that Rome fell because it did not have a sufficient inner base. Daniel had told us the same thing about the Roman Empire 600 years earlier than the Roman, first century Roman Empire. In Daniel 2, 41 through 42, 
And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, forasmuch as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the to toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so shall the kingdom be partly strong and partly broken. That's describing the first century Roman Empire. Iron and clay did not have a sufficient inner base. <coughs> What does this all say to us today? Is the moral base of our country growing stronger or is it weakening? Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Are we being exalted by righteousness or are we suffering under the reproach of sin in this country today? As we study the judgment of Rome, we should pause to notice the growing similarities between Rome and our own country, from the sexual promiscuity to the glorification of violence and greed. Rome began as an instrument for God to use in the proclamation of his gospel. The Roman peace allowed the gospel to spread over the entire known world. And we saw how Paul would use his own Roman citizenship to further the spread of the gospel. That was how Rome began. We had a similar beginning in the plan of God, didn't we? I think this country was founded, part of God's providence, to, to spread the gospel, Christ. But will we face a similar end as Rome? Once we've, we're no longer fulfilling that purpose? Perhaps our study of warning trumpets is more relevant than we would care to think. Verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. From out of the bottomless pit comes a terrible invasion of locusts. Again, I like how Barclay describes it. The devastation locusts can inflict and the terror they can cause is well nigh incredible, he writes. All through the Old Testament, the locust is the symbol of destruction. And the most vivid and terrible descri description of them and of their destructiveness is in the first two chapters of Joel. Those two chapters of Joel should be read in full and set beside this description in Revelation, Barclay writes. There are some other things in the first two chapters of Joel, but that is true. That's one of the things you'll find there. Barclay also tells us some important facts about locusts and about locust invasions. He says, The locusts breed in desert places and invade the cultivated lands for food. They may be about two inches in length and a wingspan of four to five inches. They will travel in a column of a hundred feet deep and as much as four miles long. When such a cloud of locust appears, it is as if there had been an eclipse of the sun and even great buildings less than 200 feet away cannot be seen. The destructiveness they cause is beyond belief, he writes. When they've left an area, not a blade of grass is to be seen. The trees are stripped of their bark. Land where the locusts have settled looks as if it's been scorched with a, a brush fire. Not one single living thing is left. When they move, they move inexorably on like an army with leaders. People have dug trenches, lit fires, and even fired cannon in an attempt to stop them without success. They come on in a steady column which climb hills, enter houses, and leave scorched earth behind. Okay, that's an ordinary locust. These are not ordinary locusts. These are not ordinary locusts. These are much worse in chapter 9. Ordinary locusts attack the vegetation. These locusts are told not to attack the vegetation. Instead, they're told in verse 4 to, to attack only those men who have not received the seal on their foreheads. Well, who are these people without the seal on their foreheads? 
I mean, we thought that was an important question before. Now that the Lord locusts are coming at us, I bet, I bet a lot more people are asking that question right now when we get to chapter 9. Who are these people that these locusts are coming after? Well, these are the people who did not receive the seal from God in chapter 7. These are the people who are not part of the 144,000. And who are the 144,000? Well, we studied all about them. They are all of God's people. That's what this beautiful symbol of 144,000 means. All of God's people. So then who are these without the seal and outside the 144,000? Well, they're the people outside the church. And in this context, particularly, they're the Romans outside the church. The people of Rome outside the church. They don't have God's protection. They do not enjoy the blessings of Revelation 7, 13 through 17. They will not come out of the great tribulation. They have not washed their robes. They have not made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They will not be sheltered from hunger. They will not be sheltered from thirst. They will not have their tears wiped away. That's who they are. You know, one big problem with people who say that the 144,000 are not the entirety of God's people and, you know, the premillennialists all say that. One big problem with that, that view is that that leaves us with three groups of people. Three groups of people. You have the 144,000, and then you have the ungodly, and then they have this third group of the godly who are not among the 144,000. You know, presumably that's number 144,001 and number 144,002 and on, I guess. But they have three groups. That doesn't make any sense at all. Revelation is telling us the same thing the rest of the Bible is telling us, and that is that ultimately there are only two groups of people. Only two. Not three, but two. Those on God's side and those not on God's side. Those in the faithful remnant and those not in the faithful remnant. Those in Christ, those out of Christ. Those in the church, those not in the church. There is no third group. Oh, but what about all the neutral people? Maybe they're in that third group. Maybe it's all the Romans who didn't choose sides. Maybe they're in the third group. No, no. Luke eleven twenty three. He that is not with me is against me. That's pretty hard to misunderstand, isn't it? The reason the text here is not describing this group of neutral people is that there are no neutral people. Either we're on God's side or we're on Satan's side. Now, I will say it's true that not everyone is actively engaged in the battle, perhaps, but everybody's on one side or the other. You know, if it were an excuse that, well, I'm kind of neutral, I'm not as bad as this other person. If that were an excuse, and the only two people going to hell would be Hitler and Stalin. And I imagine you can find some people who will tell you that. No one is neutral in this battle. There is no church of Switzerland. Either our robes are white in the blood of the Lamb, or they are not white in the blood of the Lamb. There is no middle ground. Notice that these locusts are not operating on their own. Verse 3 tells us they're given power. Verse 4 tells us they're commanded what to do and what not to do. These locusts were fulfilling God's judgment. But verse 11, which we'll get to shortly, will tell us that the angel of the bottomless pit, again, I think almost certainly Satan, is the king of the locusts. So who's in charge of these locusts, God or Satan? God is in charge. These locusts are coming out of the, repent, or the pit in response to a trumpet call from heaven. Yes, Satan's involved. But God is using Satan to punish Rome, just as God will one day use Satan to punish everybody who is opposed to God and outside the church. Satan is being used here as God's instrument of punishment and judgment. So do these verses mean that Satan and his minions can do whatever they want? That's not what we see here. These locusts are not allowed to harm those who have been sealed by God. In fact, verse 5 tells us 
that Satan and his agents don't even have unlimited power over evil men yet. As bad as this situation now is for Rome, it could still become much worse. But Satan here is, these locusts are limited even with what they can do to evil men. You know, the day may come, and I think the day is coming, when Satan is given free reign over those opposed to God. But that day has not yet come. And is there any better description of hell than the place where God at last turns his back completely on the ungodly and allows Satan free will to do with them whatever Satan wills. Isn't that a horrible thought? Next week we'll continue on here with the fifth trumpet. As we see, these trumpets are getting ever more serious. This book is marching on toward its conclusion. And we're going to see soon the bowls of God's wrath that are poured out upon the unrepentant Romans. Next week we'll continue on in our discussion of these verses. Thank you very much for your attention.